And the next speaker is uh, Suvik Mukherjee uh, Mukherja <laughs> from um, Presidency University in Calcutta, India. And the title of his talk is The Playing Fields of Empire, Empire and Space in Video Games. Welcome. Um, thank you, Anita. Um, it's always a pleasure to be here at this conference. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, I, I must say that this is something that I, I haven't, I haven't uh, worked with, uh, theorized, but I've thought about this for a long time. So, but do, so do excuse me if, uh, well, uh, excuse the glitches. Uh, but, um, you know, empire for me, and for many, many, I mean, for everybody, I think is is a very problematic word. Uh, in fact, a politically wrong word nowadays, um, because um, there is there's this whole idea of geopolitical expansion, then taking over someone's ideology or taking over someone's land and capital and institutions, and whatever. Um, in the present scenario, however, this clear popularity of empire-building games is something that I think deserves critical attention. I mean, we f think, I mean, it's, it's like nice to play empire building games. Many people play this. So how does one explain the relevance of empire in one of the newest media of culture, storytelling, what have you? So I'm, I'm going to look at this, uh, I'm going to concentrate more on this particular game called Empire Total War, which as you see from the title, is extremely politically wrong, empire and total war. But I'm just going to look look at it um, and and uh, sort of explore explore what this does to video games and also what this does to the concept of empire per se. Excuse me. So um, we have uh, we have this one of these uh, biggest apologists for empire, Cecil Rhodes, um, playing this video game uh, in a way. He wants to annex all the planets like a Star Wars Empire video game. And it's not very unhappy about it or not, not, doesn't have any problems about it. So um, one thing about empire is that it's, it's kind of expanding space, getting more space, uh, taking over people's uh, territory. No problems with that. And uh, of course, uh, how, it, how does it do it? It maps. So it has cartography. It takes Africa and say, oh, this is going to be this particular land for Belgium, this for, uh, this for France, this for whoever. And uh, it's all sorted. And then there is the other thing. You name things. So why is, for example, Mount Everest not called Mount Shovik or Mount Stefan or Mount Runa? Because somebody called George Everest, who's British uh, surveyor, he's like, he decided to name it after himself. Um, so you see something and you name it. Um, and the other part is, you just go and have flags. Built up empires. We stole countries. That's, what you, that's how you build an empire. Do you hear this? We stole countries with the cunning use of flags. Yeah. <laughs> Just sail around the world and stick a flag in. I claim India for Britain. And they go, you can't claim us, we live here. 500 million of us. Do you have a flag? <laughs> we don't need a bloody flag, it's our country, you bastard. No flag, no country, you can't have one. <laughs> That's the rules. That <laughs> so, um, just to, uh, it, it's kind of, as I said, uh, still in development, work in progress. So, just to look at how empire is defined in video games. Um, can you see that? Is it okay? Um, one of the things is line of sight. The more you can see, the more is yours. And have buildings and institutions. Send your military, military presence, tax people, uh, have pu take over the public management. Of course, if you are nice, then do diplomacy. Um, and then you convert people, like in Age of Empires. You send a wizard or you send your diplomat, you convert, you buy armies, you take over places. This is one way of uh, looking at uh, you know, empire. In, uh, these are like things that I've identified in video games. Um, I'm not the only person, Rolf Nor. Uh, <laughs> Uh, writes in 2010 about resource control, adequate capital economy, and just a uh, spatial kind of taking over. Nor also makes a point about empire being like, you know, uh, having the colonies as the periphery and everything to move towards the center. And he also brings in uh, 
together with Stefan, he brings in the problematic co concept of Lebensraum in German, which is like almost an organic kind of reason for, for growing empire. You human beings grow, so space has to grow. And um, uh, so uh, Stefan uh, showed you this, uh, shown you this pr uh, picture of Ratzel, who's this uh, proponent of Lebensraum. I'm not going to so these are, these are some kind of ideas of empire uh, in video games. Now, empire always has been associated with games. So uh, apparently, uh, Wellesley, uh, Lord, uh, Duke of Wellington, said that uh, um, he, he, the Battle of Waterloo was uh, fought and won on the playing fields of Eton. And there is this uh, identification with the great game. The British said that they played the great game with Russia for, for getting empire. So we have uh, obviously, obviously uh, financial institutions, governments, they are playing this great game. And uh, um, here, uh, I just kind of uh, point out uh, this quote by Lord Curzon. Um, I just read out. He says that uh, Turkestan, Afghanistan, Transcaspia, Persia, they're not romantic things. They're subjects of more even romance for, for others. For me, they're like pieces on a chessboard. Um, which is going to be played out for a game of the dominion of the world. Um, and uh, obviously, if you, if you read Rudyard Kipling's Kim, it's all about the great game being fought, and it's being fought by surveying. The more you see, the more you get. And I'm coming to this other concept, by, uh, which I've uh, got from Stefan, uh, maps preceding territory. Uh, Espen mentioned Baudrillard in the morning. Um, uh, so... Let me take you back to um, the slideshow. So this is, you see the line of sight, you see the cities, mm -hmm. you send diplomats and all that. And you also have something like this, which is the Molotov-Ribbentrop uh, Pact, where they just drew a line across Poland and pff, that was it. I mean, maps precede territory. Right. Um, and suddenly, I mean, the idea of kind of empire has been changing. I mean, you, you can see from, oh, excuse me, you can see from this video, um, oops, uh, well, uh, the, the whole uh, kind of, well, the Euro European uh, continent kind of changing its, uh, its orientation. And uh, so I'm kind of interested now in looking at, uh, um, again, taking on from where Stefan uh, uh, left of yesterday, uh, I'm interested in, in looking at uh, three types of spaces in kind of examining this idea of empire. And for me, well, um, you probably remember uh, perceived space, conceived space, and lived space in, in Lefebvre, uh, which Stefan mentioned yesterday. Perceived space, you kind of, uh, you're going there yourself as an individual experiencing space physically conceived you're looking at it as an imagined space, like an, a map, and lived is perhaps um, uh, defined better as real and imagined together. And it's like a collective kind of experience of space, as, as Stefan said, as different from perceived space. And uh, here Stefan argues that video games together today are mostly a presentation of perceptual space. And as Lefebvre addresses the individual experience of space, what he calls spatial practice, in contrast, representations of sp space differ from this phenomenal experience of space. Um, so video game maps are essential for orientation, especially in games paid from the first person perspective. I haven't come to what Stefan says about lived spaces here yet. So um, bear with me a second. So I have another little, sorry, I'm just kind of uh, doing this. Um, so. I'd like to look at uh, this whole idea of spaces and games. First is the Sega history of the British Empire, or the creative assembly history of the British Empire. So how Empire Total War is kind of constructing Indian history for us is, is interesting um, for me, um, because, I mean, uh, this is different from what I read in school, certainly. Um, so they say that, okay, interesting, the victory, victory conditions. England capture and hold 23 regions by the end of the year 1750, including Hindustan, which is where I come from, Florida, Gibraltar, Iceland, New France, Leeward Islands. And then they say things like, unlike the Mughals, the Maratha rulers are Indian princes and kings. They know the value of the Indian way of doing things, the age-old strength of now, who's Indian? What's Indian? That's one, one tricky question they don't really go into. And uh, uh, I mean, and then in the later uh, uh, section, they say, 
This then is the fundamental aim of Britain, to side with the weak in Europe against the strong and steal as many overseas positions as possible while doing it. So this is the Sega history of the empire. Uh, and they also very conveniently put in tea plantations when they're not discovered. The game starts in 1700. Tea is discovered by the British in 1820s. Um, there are no indigo plantations. Indigo is a very problematic uh, crop because it uh, raises lots of protests. All the religion centers are Hindu in India. Um, God knows what's happening to the Muslims, although they rule India at this time. Um, so there are Western buildings like ordnance factories, grand admiralties, and things like that. And uh, uh, there are lots of historical uh, uh, you know, uh, things that they have kind of played fast and loose with. Um, and the designers, obviously, construct maps, the, their cartographies, in, uh, in uh, accordance with this. Then I have the player's view of empire. First is the designer's view of empire, then the players. And the players talk about, I mean, the maps are created by player action. And they talk about something, I mean, players have, uh, especially RTS players do this after action reports. They write about their experience of playing the game. So, and the after action reports are often subversive. For example, this one. Empire Total War is fun, but playing as the major powers is not, so he wants to play it harder and because of why, he wants to play as pirates, duh, and he wants to convert Europe to Islam. And he thought it would be quite funny if he could pull it off. Amusing, but also really hard. So you have a subversive kind of way of kind of constructing empire. And as you can see, he's invaded uh, uh, Malta with an unplayable function, uh, normally an unplayable faction, the Barbary pirates. He's modded the game, and he's now trying to capture Malta. So there you go. Um, so here, I, I also kind of come across another uh, little uh, issue, is this chap who's playing, he says, uh, there's this question in the forum, how to win in India? And he says, do it the Eddie Izzard way. But then he says, oh, but then I realized that the bastards did have flags. So that's the problem. So, I mean, wh what, what do you do? I mean, how do you, how do you kind of uh, understand this? And there's also, I mean, moving on from where, where uh, Stefan kind of uh, uh, enters the discussion, Stefan talks about the perceived space of doom, which can be looked at, uh, and then he moves on to the conceived map of Ghost Recon, where you can see the map, and then you can, you can uh, uh, identify what's going on in the game. There are two levels. I'm also looking at the lived space here, where you have trade diplomacy of the player, the player experience, which and the collective player experience, which perhaps kind of gives you an idea of the lived space. And uh, so it's a perceived space of imagined cartographies, at the same time, the real player experience, so real and imagined at the same time. And this is what brings me to this uh, other discussion of third spaces by Edward Soja. Now, Soja talks about, I mean, how, how do you conceive of the lived space? What is the lived space and what, how does it work for Soja? So just says that in empire, uh, or sorry, so just says that uh, space, this third space is like an othering, which always pushes to, uh, uh, against any conception of understanding space. So it's an other space. It's real space and imagined space, but it's always pushing the margins. And uh, he says that uh, in this critical thirding, he calls it a thirding, the original binary choice is not dismissed entirely, but is subjected to a creative process of restructuring selectively and strategically from two of the opposing categories to open new alternatives. And here I bring in somebody called Edward Said, who talks about, uh, well, Orientalism, uh, looking at the East in a certain way. I'm sure you're familiar with Said. And Said is talking about uh, Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, where the protagonist goes into the depths of Africa. And he's, anybody who's watched Apocalypse Now will know, uh, uh, you know the basic idea of the Heart of Darkness. He meets this man called Kurtz. But Conrad wants us to see how Kurtz's great looting adventure Marlowe's journey up the river and narrative all share a common theme. Europeans performing acts of imperial mastery and will in or about Africa. Whether they're critical of, of the MP imperial intentions or not, they're still kind of carrying out this act of mastery, going into space, taking it over, going into the imagined space, taking it over. 
We also bring in the work of somebody called Gayatri Chakravati Spivak, who's a uh, well, uh, post-colonial theorist. Um, and here you see he sh uh, Spivak discusses a story where the subaltern woman, this disadvantaged woman, not going into the discussion of subaltern here, but uh, she is kind of portrayed as, in the final scene, her body uh, uh, kind of falls on the map of India that's been drawn on the floor by a schoolmaster, and her bloody uh, kind of uh, corpse falls there. So, despite the emancipatory promises of national independence, uh, Davy discusses how older forms of gender and class-based exploitation, such as bonded labor and prostitution, continue to be practiced in post-colonial India. And so the point is, it's not just about, uh, about uh, you know, empire good and independence, sorry, empire bad, independence good. It's, it's a problem. Independence is also a problem of empire. After, after independence in, in India, just after independence, you have... You have all these things happening. And it's interesting that she's portrayed this woman falling on the map of India. Right, and I'll show you in a moment why. So Spivak says that the space of the displacement of colonization, decolonization, reversal, and the space that can become a representation of decolonization as such. So it's kind of, it is space in which we're representing, we're talking about colonization, and it's also space in, in terms of which we're talking about re decolonization. This is uh, probably well known to anybody who does post-colonial courses, a map of Kukuana land from King Solomon's mines. You see, there's a mouth of, there's a mouth, there's Sheba's breasts, and it's like a woman's body. The map to be taken over like a woman's body. You possess a woman's body, you possess empire, you possess land. This is uh, the picture of Bharat Mata, Mother India, after independence, very kind of patriotic and all that. But incidentally, it's also kind of the Indian map as a woman's body. And this is after decolonization and so on. So empire, whether it's there or it's not there, carries this idea of possession and possession of space, spatial possession. So one of my points here is about colonial spaces. Um, how the colonial maps, I mean, I showed you the Kukuana land map, the uh, ribbentrop stalin map, and, uh, but there, there is also how, uh, how kind of uh, players create maps. These are other spaces. So for example, if I'm playing as the Maratha and I capture Hawaii, uh, that's an other presentation and pushing against the idea of empire, I'm Indian, I come from a, post, a country which has been uh, colonized uh, by a Western power, but uh, I want to now to uh, kind of take this Indian faction and colonize the whole world. That's the other, other spaces, basically. And you have also, uh, this is, by the way, uh, India as captured by the British in 1750 or thereabouts. The real map would be something like this. This is the place uh, area that's been captured by the British around 1857. So again, playing as the British, I was quite ambitious. Um, so you, you have alternative history. The player creates history, and the player creates ideas of empire. It might subvert ideas of empire. You might call this a post-colonial uh, enterprise or not, but it certainly subverts. It, it, can let, it lets you subvert uh, what happens in history. And there is also the other idea of spatiality, uh, which is the more perceived idea of spatiality happening inside. In Empire Total War, what you can do is you can actually go inside a place and fight your battles. Right, so this is all happening inside one of these cities, probably. You just kind of take your army and you start fighting and you go inside. So it's the perceived and the conceived coming in. But it also happens at the same time with the construction of the lived space of what the player plays as and what the player expects people to be doing, basically. So there are all these towns and what are the people doing in there then? There is trade, there is diplomacy, there is, uh, uh, well, there, there are other things. I mean, and one major thing is protest. So any idea of empire also carries the idea of protest in this game particularly or in all Total War games. So there is this, this thirding, this pushing across the boundaries and the moment you understand an idea of, uh, of, the moment you understand empire as kind of getting territory and 
kind of occupying the spatial ex expansion and all that, you also incorporate an idea of protest. And if you see, I mean, if you, if you have some of these uh, kind of uh, cities uh, kind of, well, uh, under siege, then you see smoke rising out of the cities, which, and then you have workers riot coming in, workers rioting or letter of demands by the nobility, it's a protest. And in, in real life terms, uh, this is actually a picture of, of the Jallianwala Bagh tragedy where you see British soldiers, well, they're actually Indian soldiers in British uniform. They're shooting a, a group of unarmed protesters and they will machine gun them down, in, uh, all of them. So, uh, so you have, you have real uh, uh, ideas of protest in, incorporated in the very understanding of empire and geopolitical expansion. In the game, how does this work? Strikes, riots, and revolts, how do I stop them? So this guy is asking this question. Here, here's a very helpful answer. Playing as Sweden, he had the exact problem around the same time. You're getting more and more schools, correct? Building improved mining facilities and coals and iron factories. The people who live in the countries aren't used to such awesome, awesome machinery as the one that your country is probably using. It's costing them their jobs. The best thing is probably not to upgrade anything that brings happiness in the lower classes, that brings down the happiness. So no, no upgrades part of your empire and let them destroy some of the factories they want to and replace stuff with body houses if, and these things can help. Well, just replace them with kind of uh, with more prostitution rackets or whatever. And uh, that's, so this is, this is uh, uh, I mean, the game idea of protest. But at the same time, I mean, this is, this is how this player wants to tackle protest, but protest is a very real thing in the game. And you cannot really play the game without, or you cannot really conceive of empire in the game without conceiving or dealing with protest, right? How you deal with it is up to you. And whether this is a viable solution for empire is... Uh, anyway, so um, to make a long story short, it's a long paper, I'm just kind of going to, uh, well, uh, sort of... Uh, work around this a little more, but um, you, can also, you can also change the idea of empire. I mean, you can also change imperial history through your gameplay alternative history. You, you build your own empire, you fight your own wars, and you have uh, what have you. But I think that also offers, I mean, often uses the same mechanism, the same spatial mechanism as empire. So on the one hand, there is protest in conceiving of empire protesting against empire. On the other hand, you can actually play as the player uh, subverting empire. But when you're doing that, you're actually subscribing to the idea of empire yourself. Right. So it brings me to this rather controversial uh, concept of empire by Hart and Negri, where they say that empire hasn't really left us, really. It's, uh, there's, it's, it's about biopower. Empire kind of has it, 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 it's there in the very biological processes or, or uh, you know, that, that's necessary for, for our, our sustenance. So he brings in this Foucauldian concept. I don't want to go into this. Those of you who've noticed that kind of little, uh, well, uh, map, uh, see that I've mentioned deterritorialization, reterritorialization. Um, I will not mention the philosopher because I've done that too many times in this <laughs> conference. But uh, so, uh, I mean, it's, it's about kind of displacing an idea of empire but it doesn't really move out. And even with decolonization, it is an idea of possession. And, and I think the video game kind of, uh, this video game in particular, and uh, some other RTS games as well, illustrate this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Struvi. Okay, questions, comments? Sorry, may I just add that uh, the paper is, is much longer and I've, I've just skirted through this quite, you know, I'm very bad at time management, so I've just uh, focused on the key issues. So, well, please feel free to, yeah. And there are examples and I've given enough, I think, hopefully historical examples and other things, but well. Th thanks for a really excellent paper that raises really important issues, I think. Um, I was just thinking about political video games in general. Are there examples of games that, give different perspectives on empire and because you could obviously uh, presumably you could imagine a game that 
I don't know, gave some sort of a better perspective in some well, way. Well, we'll have to make one and then kind of think more about Empire first before we make this. But uh, I, I, I don't know of any other video game. Uh, uh, well, there are many other Empire video games, but um, certainly Empire Total War was just playing into my kind of, uh, you know, sort of a straight bat, basically. It was just Empire and Total War. Uh, and uh, so it, it addresses uh, these issues, as I've uh, said, I mean, uh, quite aptly, I believe. But uh, you could see this happening in other real-time strategy games as well. Perhaps, perhaps the mechanism of protest is something that I would really need to think about in other strategy games. But the mechanism of ex imperial expansion and subverting imperial expansion through more imperial expansion and that kind of that cyclical ex uh, thing of empire still remains in Age of Empires or Hammurabi or whatever. I mean, just go back to the very early RTS games and it's still there. So, but I don't know of any kind of uh, political uh, games or news games or whatever which actually address empire. Is that? Well, I mean, I, I don't know if there is a good way of kind of, you know, at, at all address, because it, it always kind of brings in the idea that kind of, and, and what I was trying to argue against is this, uh, is this naive uh, kind of idea that, well, when a foreign power goes away, it's, it's all done and dusted, because, you know, it's still the idea of mapping and possession. So. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sorek. This is a really, it, it, it's really interesting research and 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 ideas but just just the, just the research part of it alone is i i think fascinating and i'm but i'm going to be i'm going to ask the questions kind of i'm going i want to be the guy who just wandered in here now in in in, in a sense uh -huh. and if you look at uh, you the possession of space as a, some sort of topoy or sort of ground paradigm here you can, you of course, go outside uh, or beyond strategy games and empire and everything, and, and talk about a, 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 a wide variety of games. So you could argue that, you know, game uh, most games are about the possession. For example, action adventures. You know, you call your travel. You when you have conquered all space, the mm. the game is is, yeah. is finished, and and, and, you, and you 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 are victorious. And you can even then go further back and say. That this is, you know, part of the technology itself. It was conceived as military technology and so on. So, ban this filthy, <laughs> you know. Is 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 there some sort of a, how how would you relate to those um, ideas that computer game, uh, computer games as such, and computer game technology are inherently ideologically suspect? Julian Stellabras, for example, and those kinds of uh, approaches. <laughs> Um, uh, I really need to defend this uh, position because otherwise I'd probably uh, risk my job at President's University if I, if I, uh, well, if I kind of say that computer games are are too well inherently kind of about uh, about well expansion and whatever and everything that I say gets postcolonial tag on it so or an anti postcolonial tag so um, I think I think it's a, you're, you're on to a very very important point here and I would probably I mean my my reading of, of other kinds of games come from Stefan Gunzel and Rolf Knorr but more from Stefan Gunzel's uh, essays uh, essay uh, and uh, well, uh, another uh, kind of su something that is not on video games, but it's on cultural kind of geography, um, on the uh, on uh, these spaces. And uh, yes, I mean, I've I've also thought of this when I when I kind of got uh, a sort of. Uh, this uh, reward in Fallout 3, where I could see all this, uh, the entire map. You have to do something, it's like a perk or whatever, I've forgotten now. You can see the whole map and you possess it. But uh, I, I don't know if you do it so, uh, so clearly, so kind of like obviously and blatantly, like you do in a map of the Empire Total War or, or any of these RTS games where you're actually saying you're doing this. I am going to capture France tomorrow. And then I was like, let's let's capture a little bit of Spain and then move on like that. So that's that's one thing that I think it's it, it's perhaps in 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 the in in, in the story and the and, and the context of the game as well. Which uh, yeah, also thank you on, uh, on my behalf. I also found it convincing that in the end you you bring in a heart and agree because I mean the, the hypothesis in there is that. Like the uh, universalization of the protest is has to follow the empire, so yeah. that's probably the explanation why the computer game, even if you use it against the empire, yeah. has to stay in the same logic. Yeah. So that fits 
perfectly. And uh, but uh, a question I want to ask is. Um, do you th uh, what do you think, what you would say, which main concept of space is inherent to the empire? Um, I think it's, or my proposition would be, it's not absolute space, like mm. in Newtonian sense, but it's the totality of space. So all space that possibly is there could be possessed or is already mapped, potentially yes. mapped. Um, like if you could find these early maps like the Tabula Poiteringia from Rome, this yes. road map, the topological transformation where there's really no outside, everything is included. You don't care about topography anymore, anything is included. And I, I think th this would be a concept of space that really goes along with that. What do you think? I, I would just say thank you very much, Stefan, because it, it, it actually does, I mean, what you've just said, it adds to uh, my argument here and uh, to, to, to the building of my argument further. Um, and uh, yesterday when I was kind of listening to all the papers, I was like, I haven't really kind of, I've, I've taken this one concept of space, which you've kind of, you know, which I've uh, sort of had other people who are working on similar issues uh, <laughs> take. So I'm, I'm not going into the Newtonian idea of space, however, it's, it's more as kind of, uh, as you describe it, the space is dopus. So uh, that, that's perhaps what I will really unpick and make clear in, in the paper when I revise it. It's like, so thank you. Um, I was wondering, you seem to suggest that uh, the reason empire gets replaced with empire is maybe a political or cultural ideal, but I wonder if that's just an artifact of the fact that it's a game and you need to play and you need to have control over the pieces. Um, and I can imagine games where you don't have such direct control, like uh, maybe you could use a Sims model or a Dwarf Fortress model where you put in incentives to manage something like an anarchy, but the reason you don't do that in Total War is because you'd have to replace one control mechanism with another and it would just make an awkward game. It's not something profound and political. Yeah, thank you. Um, I uh, I would say that empire. I mean, as I've said, that uh, there is this mapping of empire as a game in itself, right? Um, uh, empire, as in the real, not empire, total war. Um, you have like statements by Curzon or by other people, many others. I mean, Cecil Rhodes, for example, uh, he was like. Uh, Queen Victoria meets Cecil Rhodes and says, Mr. Rhodes, what were you doing in the last two months when I didn't meet you? And Rhodes says, oh, madam, I was adding two provinces to your empire. So one of them is Rhodesia, by the way, very modestly named after himself. So uh, uh, so it's it's like almost it has a rule based kind of that he's perhaps constructed and, it's, and, and they're looking at it like a chessboard or a game or whatever. So that mechanic somehow translates here and I, I would say perhaps willingly by the designers or, I mean, there, there, there is that kind of element. And uh, it does, when I, while, while, you, while you play it uh, and subvert that mechanic, you actually, you actually kind of, uh, well, subscribe to the mechanic itself. That's what I was trying to say. So I think, uh, I mean, Empire itself is, was a very playful thing for certain people. I mean, it's like, it's a great game. You go and survey different places in Tibet and that's like, you know, if you read Kim, it's it's all about you know it's it's a very playful thing that that they in in which he's portraying it. So yeah, not sure. Okay, thank you, Shovik. Thank you very much.